Yeah, as you mentioned, my name's Matt, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about some work that I did jointly at the University of Illinois with John Alsop and Srita Adve. Uh, and as he said, this work is about defining a better memory consistency model for heterogeneous systems. And specifically, we're focusing on relaxed atomics, or rats. And when I think of rats, I think of the movie Ratatouille, where everyone can cook. But if you think a little bit more about it, Rats cooking have a lot of serious health code violations that at least personally uh, are very concerning. And when you, uh, unfortunately, memory consistency has a, a rat's problem of its own because everyone thinks they can use relaxed atomics. And just as with those health code violations with Remy, relaxed atomics have their own correctness violations uh, that are extremely difficult to reason about correctly. And one of the Several problems is that there is no formal definition. So what exactly are relaxed atomics? The most up-to-date specification in C++ 17 refers to them as races that do not order any other accesses, and uh, thus says that they can be ordered with any other memory operations to potentially improve performance and energy efficiency. However, this is not formalized, and the specification only provides a vague notion, uh, wording rather, that implementations of this should avoid out of thin air values, with no specification about how to actually do that, as uh, I can see a few of you nodding along in the audience. Um, and this makes it extremely difficult to use them correctly, so it's no wonder that programmers find it frustrating. For example, what I have here is a unsolicited email I received from one of the major research labs while we were doing this work, where the only change I've made is to re remove all the curse words. Um, but what this person told me is that, uh, or told us rather, is that C++'s relaxed atomics were the worst idea ever. I just spent days and days trying to get something to work. My example only has two addresses and four accesses. It shouldn't be this hard. Can you help? Um, so getting this code to work correctly is extremely hard, even for people who are experts. And one of the major underlying problems is that we don't have a formal specification for them, and this has come, happened despite many years of effort trying to do so. So if it's this difficult to use them correctly, then why do we bother? Well, of course, because we can get better performance, and in most cases when we use them, we can use them correctly. What I have shown here is on a discrete GPU for a series of benchmarks that do use relaxed atomics. And you can see that we can get significant speed ups in many of these cases if we can reason about how to use them correctly. And that's why people are willing to put up with relaxed atomics, because the benefits of doing so are very high. Uh, but unlike in multi-core CPUs, which rely on complex hardware coherence protocols like MESI, as we talked about in previous sessions here this week already, heterogeneous systems have simple software-based coherence protocols. And this means that although in multi-core systems we can hide these, these benefits from relaxed atomics, we really can't in heterogeneous systems because the cost of avoiding them is just too high. So, the previous work has tried to address this long-standing problem by providing formal semantics for every possible use of relaxed atomics. And despite about 15 years of effort by some very talented people, they've been unable to come up with a satisfactory formal set of semantics. Our insight to help address this problem is instead of trying to address every possible case of how they could be used, to analyze how programmers actually use them in real applications. And specifically, we used three questions to guide this work. First, what are those common use cases? Second, why do they work? Why can they use relaxed atomics? And third, armed with this knowledge, can we formalize a way to use them safely? And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is how we did that by first identifying a series of common relaxed atomics in these systems, things like work queues and event counters, reference counters and seek locks and so on. And second, a new memory consistency model that we introduced called Data Race Free Relaxed, or DRF Relax, which builds on the existing work with the data SC for Data Race Free models and provides sequentially consistent centric semantics for all programs along with efficiency. And finally, we evaluated the benefit of using relaxed atomics in a tightly coupled system with CPUs and GPUs, and we saw that we can get up to 53% fewer cycles, and 40% better energy in these systems, which 
are arguably already have a better baseline model than the one in the discrete GPUs that I mentioned earlier. So ultimately, our contribution is to make it easier for everyone to safely use relaxed atomics. In the remainder of my talk, I'm going to first go over some basic background on relaxed atomics, in case some of you aren't familiar with them, uh, and then discuss the model that we introduced and show our results, and finally, I'll conclude. So first, let me give some high-level background about atomics. And they were introduced with the data race, bless you, with the data race free zero, or DRF zero model that came out in the 1990s. And how this model worked is it said that all memory accesses that are races must be identified as synchronization accesses. In C++, we use atomics for this. In Java, we use volatile. And there's other approaches in different languages. So for example, with a code snippet here, where I have two uh, ads that are accessing the same memory location, I need to label them as synchronization accesses, which, of course, in C++ means use atomics. And what DRF0 provides is that all atomics must order both other data accesses as well as other atomics. And this is really good because it ensures that we have SC semantics as long as there's no data races in our program. But the problem with it is that it now enforces ordering that may be unnecessary in some cases. And this led to subsequent work, uh, such as Data Race Free 1 or DRF1, that tried to address this problem by adding what they called unpaired atomics. And the idea with unpaired atomics is if I can label a certain atomic as not having ordering on any other atomic axes, then I can safely reorder it with data axes, but not those atomics. And that will give me better performance, although I still need to keep a total order for the atomics. And by doing so, the benefit again is that I keep SC semantics, as long as there's no data races. But still, there's cases where even this is overkill, because I'm still required to order atomics with all other atomics, even ones that might not have any uh, you know, behavior that's that, that matters to one another. And so in the, in the 2000s, this led to the introduction of relaxed atomics, which do not order any other memory accesses, data or atomics. And this can give me better performance and energy efficiency in certain cases. But like I said before, it comes with this small caveat that we violate SC. And we, as to this date, have no way to formally specify how to avoid that problem. All right, so now that I've given you a little bit of background about relaxed atomics and memory consistency models, let's look at how people are actually using relaxed atomics in practice. And recall that our approach had three steps. First, let's look at how people are actually using relaxed atomics, then understand why they work, why it's safe to use relaxed atomics in them, and finally, come up with a way to formalize semantics. So to identify how they were actually being used, we conducted a wide survey in the industry to various vendors and developers and researchers, as well as conducting a thorough sweep of the benchmark suites that existed in the space. Uh, and of course, some of you in the audience are some of the people we talked to at that point. Uh, and we came up with the following use cases that could be distilled down from all the different examples of atomics. So there was work queues and event counters, flags, seek locks, ref counters, and split counters. So I don't have time today in 15 minutes to go through every single one of those. So what I'm going to do is go through one of them in detail and then summarize the others. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions about the others if you have them. So let's look how relaxed atomics work in event counters. And some of you may know already that relaxed, or sorry, event counters are commonly known as histograms. And in histograms, there's multiple threads that are concurrently updating a shared counter or counters. And for simplicity, I'm showing them those counters as residing in the L2. Although, of course, in reality, that doesn't need to happen. Um, so the way that event counters work is they'll read part of a data array, and they'll update the according counter. So it may be the case that all of those updates go to different counters. But it could also be the case that we have multiple threads that are incrementing the same counter. And because they're doing so simultaneously, those increments are going to race. And that means we have to use atomics to safely perform those accesses. So we'll continue going on and doing increments throughout this, these, this series of the program. And eventually, we come to some final state for the values of the counters. 
Once we've done so, then we will, and only then, will we go on and use those values elsewhere in the program. So, so the key here is that the order we did those updates, they were commutative. It didn't matter what update we did them within a given thread because we didn't look at those values until all of the updates had happened. So the final result was the same no matter what. And we exploit this intuition uh, in the DRF Relax memory model. Uh, in, and on in the next slide, I'll talk about how we formalize that. We did it by adding a new category of relaxed atomics called commutative. And the formalism has many more details in the paper, but uh, the idea here is exactly what I said. We, have, we require that the axes be commutative with one another, and that the intermediate values from those updates must not be observed by any thread in the program, and especially must not be used to influence control flow. And if the programmer uh, obeys these rules with their axes, then we guarantee that the final result of their program will always be SC. And uh, I'll pause to note here that this is a slight deviation from the traditional de uh, definition of sequential consistency, because we're only guaranteeing that the final result is SC, not that every step of the way in the program is. But if your program fits in this category where it's using relaxed atomics for commutative axes, that is likely a trade-off that you're willing to make. So let me briefly then talk about the other use cases. And what I'm going to do is categorize them into uh, three different categories. So first, with work queues, we found that we could provide SC semantics already for them because of the benefits they were getting from relaxed atomics were from using DRF1, which, as I mentioned before, had already been introduced, although mainstream memory consistency models had not yet adopted it. So we simply codify that addition, excuse me, into our DRF Relax memory model. For flags, which use a flag to communicate between multiple threads and indicate when certain conditions have happened, we introduce a new category, non-ordering, but again, we can guarantee that we provide SC semantics for that category. Seek locks have a lot of similarities to event counters in that the final result is always guaranteed to be SC, but they have a little bit different, different behavior in terms of how those accesses proceed. So we have a separate category uh, speculative for them, but again, the semantics we guarantee are that the final result is SC. And finally, the most uh, complex use cases are ref counters and split counters. And in these use cases, unlike the previous four, we are truly violating sequential consistency. So when a programmer uses a reference counter or a split counter and they use relaxed atomics in that code, they're doing so usually with the knowledge that they are not going to get a sequentially consistent result. But what we found is that they're actually okay with this in these programs because all they really want is an approximate answer. They only want to know, say uh, in many cases, like to an order of 1,000 or 10,000, what the current count in the system is. And so we exploit that and in, in, with this new category, quantum, where we isolate the parts that need this approximate value to be returned from the remainder of the program. So the result here is SC-centric, but again, is stronger than what the existing model, models will provide you. All right, so we compared the configurations, uh, these configurations, these different memory consistency models, in a tightly coupled CPU-GPU system that had coherent caches and a unified address space. And each node has its own L1 cache. For the GPU nodes, we have, or, or compute units, excuse me, we have, they have scratch pads. And we use a tiled shared L, uh, L2 as the last level cache. And to simulate this, we used a combination of GEMS, SIMIX, Garnet, GPU SIM, and GPU Watch and MCPAT for the energy measurements. And the configurations we compared are the three memory consistency models that I introduced earlier, DRF0, DRF1, and DRF Relax, with the GPU-style coherence protocol and the de novo coherence protocol that Sarita talked to you yesterday about during the Spandex talk. In case you didn't see that, the, the one thing to keep in mind, at least as it relates to this talk, is that de novo is going to obtain ownership for written dirty data and atomics, whereas GPU coherence is not. And finally, for workloads, we first wrote microbenchmarks for each use case. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to show those results today. But the take home is that 
Relax atomics help a little for those, uh, on average 10% improvements for cycles and 5% improvement for energy. Uh, but what I am going to show results for are the benchmarks from that discrete GPU that I showed you earlier that get the best speed up with relaxed atomics. So UTS, or unbalanced tree search, pay drink, and between the centrality. And I have six bars that I'm going to show you for each application. The three blue bars are the GPU coherence with DRF0, DRF1, and DRF relax. And the three green bars are the same, but with de novo coherence. So in terms of execution time, what we see uh, is that relaxed atomics can significantly reduce the number of cycles that we need by, by about up to 50% in the best case. Uh, and this shows that we can get large benefits by using them and using them correctly in these systems. And moreover, when we compare GPU coherence with de novo, we see that the ability to obtain ownership for these atomics also allows an additional boost of about 10%. In terms of energy, the trends are similar here. Uh, relaxed atomics often reduce energy consumption as well. And de novo's ability to reuse data also helps us reduce the total energy by about 30% compared to GPU coherence with the same memory consistency model. So to conclude, what I've talked about today is how relaxed atomics can provide significant benefits to the programmer. But in, re in heterogeneous systems where we have relatively simple coherence protocols, the cost of avoiding them is just too high, despite the issues with reasoning and using them correctly that exist in modern languages due to the lack of a formal specification. Our key insight to help address this problem was to analyze how real codes use relaxed atomics and then introduce a new memory consistency model, DRF Relax, that provides SC-centric semantics and efficiency for all of those use cases while building on the existing approaches to providing memory consistency. And the net result is that we can put a hazmat suit around our rat so that everyone can use them safely. All right. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Questions? OK. I see one in already. Yeah, I was wondering, um, can you check that your program is DRF uh, relaxed? Yeah, so I didn't. Uh, that's a very good question. I didn't talk about it at all in the, in the talk, although our papers do have uh, models built in that you can read about and, and see in there if you want to. But we used the herd memory model tool to formally specify the behavior of our memory model and then check that it was performing correctly for all of these different use cases. So uh, again, if you're interested in using that, it's in the paper. It's something you can, can grab and, and use on your own. I mean more, um, given a program, can you check if it is uh, or? Um, all right, so I, I think what you're saying is if I give you some random program, how do I know if it obeys DRF relax or not? Yeah, so the herd memory model will give you that answer. You could, throw, you could plug your program into that model, and if it violates any of the rules for these different categories, excuse me, that I showed you a few slides ago, oop, right here, if it violates any of those rules, the herd memory model will tell you and will show you exactly what access is violating those rules. Um, so uh, again, you know, if that's something you're interested in, we can talk more about it. But the model is in the paper and is freely available to anyone who's, who's interested in it. So I've just got a question about GPU coherence. So you didn't explain that completely. If you're going to do an optimized histogram, let's say on the GPU, you would use the scratch pad and you'd use scoped atomics. Yep. Well, you know, you know, and I don't believe you're doing that here. Um, so I didn't show results for it, but in the paper we do have results for both a histogram that does everything globally as well as one that uses scopes and does it in the scratch pad. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what the performance energy benefits were for either of them. I, I can tell you, roughly speaking, that doing more of them in global memory gives you a better performance boost with relaxed atomics, but yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we compared both of them, and, and we have those numbers in the paper. And even with the scratch pad, we did see some performance boost from the relaxed atomics when you do the, the final updates to, to global memory. So 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In the I, mean, paper. I suppose I would contend that if you use the scope of atomics from something like OpenCL or something, then you could use SC, just standard SC in the scratch pads, and you probably wouldn't lose any performance, right? Which is the, the key thing. And it's only reference counting that you'd really care about them for a relaxed atomics. So that's the. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I do have a separate talk, which I don't have time to give today, <laughs> but about. Uh, <laughs> about HRF versus DRF in heterogeneous systems. And in that paper, what we showed is that if you redesign the coherence protocol to be a little bit, uh, which is roughly speaking the difference between de novo and GPU coherence here, you actually can do even better than what scopes provide you across a wide range of applications. Right. Um, and just, sorry, one last thing I wanted to point out. For the histogram, you're absolutely right that uh, you know, scopes can benefit there, but that's the only application of all of the microbenchmarks and the benchmarks here where scopes would provide any benefit. For the rest of them, because the atomics have to be global, if you're going to pay the penalties that, that you see here. Well, they don't have to, but they could be into the L2, right? And then even on the L2, on, on many GPUs, right. you still use scopes, you'd get better than going to global. And so I, I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I yeah. apologize. I wasn't yeah. being clear. By right. global scope, I meant going to the L2. Right, okay. My apologies. That's cool. Thank you, man. Vijay has a question. Oh. Okay, we're running a little short on time, so last one. Oh, where was the question? Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, I was curious about during uh, the keynote uh, of ISCA, so Kunle Olukotun seemed to claim that uh, machine learning algorithms use what seem like mm -hmm. lots of relaxed atomics. Any thoughts on whether uh, that could be modeled or uh, uh, its semantics clarified? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we have looked at some of the benchmarks in the Hog Wild set of work or the Star Wild set of work that Kunle and his students did. Um, you can definitely use relaxed atomics in most, if not all, of them. The you know the one uh, maybe more philosophical point I'll bring up here is. While you can use them in those codes today and they're safe, they're safe because of reasons like the ones I talked about in this work. And so adding this uh, memory model would not change the performance they see or the energy that benefits they see, but would provide the benefit of when someone else picks up their code and tries to look at it and understand why it's behaving the way it's behaving, mm -hmm. they have a lot more scaffolding than just looking at their code and saying, oh, it uses relaxed atomics and now you have to reason about why that's safe and reason about why it's correct and so on and so forth. So the way they use relaxed atomics is correct as the model exists today, but could be made better by incorporating something like this with very minimal effort on their part. Does that make sense? Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt.